Thank you. Good morning, or I should probably say good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Into the Unknown debate. Now, in this debate today, I'm delighted to be jo joined by three fantastic speakers. So if I introduce first Elizabeth Seward. Elizabeth is Senior Strategist for the Space Systems Division of Airbus, the largest builders of spacecraft and satellites in the UK. Martin Rees, Astronomer Royal and author of On the Future, Prospects for Humanity. He is the former president of the Royal Society. And on my right, Tony Milligan, philosopher and author of Nobody Owns the Moon, currently based at King's College London. The opening topic, of course, is, is it essential to reach out into the unknown? Should we applaud a return to grand adventures with the potential to replenish the planet's depleted resources from the moon, from Mars, or even from beyond? Or should we give up on our space odysseys and recognise that the scale of space actually leaves us trapped amid the barren planets of our own solar system? So without further ado, I'm going to kick off with Martin Rees. Could you please give us your take on this topic? Right. Well, of course, we've got to remember that when men landed on the moon, uh, that was done for political reasons. And there was no follow-up because the Americans had spent 4% of their federal budget on it, and it wasn't worth continuing. But humans, if they explore, I think will go as high-risk adventurers. People like Sir Randolph Fiennes, prepared to take very high risks. So my scenario for manned space flight is that it should not be supported by taxpayers, it should be supported by the billionaires and sponsorship, etc. And it should be done um, as an uh, uh, adventure and spectator sport. But I hope that some people do land on Mars uh, by the end of a century, um, accepting very high risks. Um, but I think it's crazy to believe in mass emigration to Mars. It's a dangerous delusion to think that we can escape Earth's problems by going to Mars. Dealing with climate change is hard, but it's a doddle compared to making Mars an attractive place to live. <laughs> um, but if you look very far, far ahead, um, I think we can imagine that these people on Mars are going to be ill-adapted and they will use all the technologies of uh, bio and cyborg and gene modification, etc., to adapt to that strange environment. And they will be um, uh, the precursors of our post-human species and they may become completely electronic. We'll be comfortable here on Earth, we won't change so fast. But they will become electronic and then, if they are near immortal, then of course they would even be able to voyage beyond our solar system because that is certainly a post-human, not human enterprise. So uh, practical uh, space doesn't need humans at all, but I hope they will go as an adventure. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. And over to you, Tony. OK. I think that there is something that the machinery, robots, technology can't do for us, and that is to have certain kinds of experiences. Now, space opens up a range of those experiences. But broadly speaking, I think, I'm in agreement with, with Martin about certain aspects of this. I think that the idea of mass migration to Mars is a, is a, is a crazy notion. I don't think that there is any inbuilt, innate human wanderlust that means that in some way we would be running against our human nature and, and, and malcontented if we failed to go to uh, out into space. I think in certain respects it's a done deal that we are going to go. I don't think the drivers for that are, as it were, intrinsic to human nature. I think the drivers for that are intrinsic to the kinds of socio-economic uh, and political systems that, we are, that we, are, we are generating. I would love the idea that the private sector could carry the, the burden and that it should not fall upon the, uh, upon the multitude. I do have a reservation about that, or two reservations. One is that, to some extent, you have to buy your way into influence upon programmes. So if that's what we're doing in terms of state involvement, then that's a, a plausible thing to do. And, and secondly, I think that if we want to go into space in a way which abides by certain ethical standards of, of justice and fairness, that it, it shouldn't be simply an arena for America, Russia, 
maybe India and some of the larger players, if we are to have those other voices in space from the smaller nations, even from indigenous people who have launch sites set down in, in, the, in their territory as well, then, uh, then the state has to have a, a role in the funding of space programmes to try and find pathways for those voices to be heard. Thank you. And lastly, over to you. Do you think it's essential to human life that we voyage into the unknown? I mean, I would argue that it is, and I would challenge your, your views on, on human wanderlust. We've always explored, we've gone to the next valley, we've crossed continents and we've crossed oceans. And we've done it to survive, we've done it to find new food resources, new land. Um, now that we're powered by money, we do it for wealth and for riches. Um, Raleigh you know, sailed the world, but he did it so he could bring back a ship full of goods for the Queen and, uh, and show his um, prowess with, uh, with his new spices and things. And neurobiologists have discovered, in fact, that um, curiosity and new discoveries are rewarded in the pleasure centre of the brain in the same way that other basic instincts like food are. And if we take this into computers and machine learning, um, programs that they put a reward bonus for trying new things actually um, achieve better results faster than programs without. And many programs without this extra bonus get stuck in a loop because they can't find another way out of a problem. And so I think it is um, inbuilt in us. Um, I think space has been inspiring us for a long time. I think that the, the Apollo program was indeed a, a political driver, but that you can't really say that we stopped when it finished. We didn't have that same impetus as um, racing against the Russians, but it, it changed and it transformed into building the International Space Station and collaboration with the Russians, and a collaboration that has continued even in the face of political discord. Um, Mike Griffin is a, an ex-administrator of NASA, and he described space exploration as cathedral building, that in the old days, um, people built cathedrals for the majesty of the building. And in fact, they, it, they were long-term projects that the, the sort of instigators of sometimes never even saw the end, if you look at the Gaudi building in, in Barcelona. But along the way, they learned a lot of other things. They learned how to work together, they learned the challenges, and they advanced civil engineering that also benefited everybody in their normal house buildings. And so if we look at the grand um, projects of space in a similar way, we are making international partnerships and working together and hopefully leaving something as inspiring behind. Thank you. So you've heard the three pitches for the theme of this debate. Now in 1969, it seemed like exploring the solar system was sort of the, the biggest priority of our time. However, now we have global warming, we have an abund abundance of political crises going on here on Earth. So the first theme of the debate is going to be, should we go into space now? Is there any point? Is this something we should be exploring now? And if so, why? So Elizabeth, if I can put that to you first of all. Well, I mean, I, I mentioned it a little bit, but um, the question of should we be in space almost to me is mute. We, we rely on space so much in our everyday life. Um, we build satellites for all sorts of reasons, but we use it for weather forecasting, for climate tracking, for GPS, so you know where you are, but also the timing system in it is used for banking and transactions. If, if we didn't do anything in space today, actually life would not be as you know it now. It would be quite different. Um, but if we talk about people in space, um, then we've been in the International Space Station since the year 2000. There have continuously been people in orbit above our heads since that time. So it's 19 years on now. Um, and, and there's an argument from the scientists that the science that they do, the microgravity research, isn't really worth the cost. But there are some interesting spin-off technologies if you look at the, the economics. So the ESA said that in 10 years they've had 150 new commercial technologies, so people making money off it, with 20 new companies. And some of these are things that are, are essential. So uh, flight suit monitoring is now used for babies and sudden infant death syndrome. Or a planetary radar is being used to detect landmines. And so a lot of the benefits from space are things that we wouldn't even imagine when we started, but are really valuable. But then should we not then be making a distinction between kind of close space exploration and like much further exploration because obviously presumably we can't have any advantages from far exploration and uh, an awareness of outer space to help us with climate change or a lot of the for more debates talks and interviews 
Subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI-TV.